ஓம் நமோ பகவதை ஸ்ரீ அருணாச்சல ரமணாய டுடே ஐ வில் பி டாக்கிங் அபவுட் or at least beginning from verse 19 of uh, Upadesha Saraha. But before I do so, I, to put it in clearly in context, I'll go back a few verses. That is, in, verse, uh, <clears throat> in the first ten verses, Bhagavan is talking about the, the path of uh, bhakti. which begins with the path of nishkarmiya karma doing nishkarmiya puja japra and dhyana and uh, uh, the, the dhyana matures from from uh, meditating on god as something other than ourselves to meditating on god as ourself which he says is the best among all in verse 8 and um uh, so up up to verse 10 he's talking about bhakti and uh, karma karma is just the preliminary stages of the nishkarmiya karma is the preliminary stages of path of bhakti but the path of bhakti matures from being uh, doing action to just being how we just be is by turning our attention within to meditate on god as not other than ourselves in other words as our own, as as i as as what we actually are um then 11 to 15 he talks about uh, the path of yoga and just like he showed in the first 10 verses how the bhakti must mature into the um into the what in tamil he calls uh, ananya bhava that's meditation on god as not other than oneself that is the path of jnana that is the path of self investigation for meditating on what is not other than ourself means meditating on ourself so it the bhakti maga eventually leads to uh, atma vichara likewise the yoga if it is to reach the goal of annihilation of mind it has it has to lead us to this path of uh, of jnana because otherwise yoga is uh, controlling the mental activity by chitta vritti chitta vritti narodaha but merely controlling the chitta vritti nirodaha results in laya a temporary dissolution of mind in order to bring about nasa the mind that is calmed by um by yo- pranayama and other yoga practices needs to be turned inwards to the path of investigation and then only will its mind die that's what bhagavan says in 14 and he concludes for, about yoga in verse 15 by saying that once the mind has died then there's nothing further to do because one has attained one's own nature then he starts the path of jnana from verse 16 in verse 16 he uh defines what is our, or he indicates what is our goal but he gives a very practical definition of the goal the goal is to see uh, is tattva darshanam tattva darshanam means seeing what is real or what actually exists um so how to see what actually exists he explains uh drishya varitum uh kept back, or withdrawn from or kept back from what is seen chittam atmana hurt chitva darshanam the mind seeing its own chitva is seeing uh, is tattva darshanam is seeing uh, tattva a uh, chitva means the mind's nature as awareness uh, so it's awareness nature in other words yes what the mind essentially is is pure awareness so that's what the mind has to see it has to see its own pure awareness and that is seeing the reality so what is this mind that is to see pure awareness in verse 17 he goes on to say that that is, how are we to see the the pure awareness or oh, one thing i'll say about verse 16 if we have a if the mind is sufficiently mature what bhagavan says in verse 16 that is sufficient if we understand but all we have to do is to withdraw our mind from all drishya from everything that is seen by turning it back within to see our own awareness if we understand that that's all that we need to do and if we have the maturity to do so but the the tattva darshana uh, results immediately but for those who need further clarification on what what he's talking about here those on verse 17 uh, talk about this mind that is that is he says the mind's own chitta in verse um Uh, 16 uh, 
the, the mind seeing its own chitpa. So what is this mind that is to see its own chitpa? Um, he, in verse 17, he says, um, manasam to kin, uh, then, then, uh, uh, Margano Krete, when investigation is done, that the mind actually is, uh, neither manasam, there's no such thing as mind at all. Margamachadat. And in the straightness, this is the part. Um, so if we investigate the, the mind, the mind as mind doesn't exist. So by, by investigating, we'll see that it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as mind at all. Um, but what is it that now appears as mind? He talks about in verse 18. He says, that the, when we use the term mind, the, generally we're talking about the mind as a collection of thoughts, as the totality of thoughts. So um, uh, he says, um, um, Vitya her mana, the mind, the thoughts are the mind. Uh, but of all the thoughts, Vitya her uh, two, aham vitin asvita, that is, all the other thoughts uh, depend on the first thought, I. And uh, therefore, what the mind essentially is, is only desire. So I learned by saying, uh, vidi aham mana, know that. I is the mind. That is, uh, when the mind can, uh, uh, when um, there's a whole, the mind consists of many thoughts, but all those many thoughts are constantly changing. The only thought that is constant, so long as the mind is there, the first thought I is there. Because all other thoughts are known by me, by I. So the, the, this thought called I, that you refer to here as uh, Ahambiti, um, and what you have, that, that means ego. So this ego, the, the subject, the knower of all other things, is, um, is, the, is the essential thought of the mind. And all other thoughts are objects known by the first thought, the thought called I, uh, the hum, um, So that is what the mind essentially is. So <clears throat> then now we come to verse 19. So he, he, all this is to clarify what he's talking about in verse 16. What he says in verse 19 is, um, Aham, I am Kota, Bhavati Chindata, Pati Aham, Nijavicharanam. That means, um, uh, Aham, I am Kota means from where did this eye rise? Babati Chimbata. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, oh, oh ba Babati is the arise, sorry. Aham, <coughs> aham, I am Kota Babati. From where did this eye rise? Chimbata, by investigating thus, i.e., i.e., is an exclamation, ah, uh, uh, pati, uh, pa, uh, patati aham. I falls down, nija vicharanam. This is self-investigation of the implication. Uh, <clears throat> that is, aham means I, ayam means this. Uh, uh, kuta means from where, bhavati means arise, uh, chimvata means by investigating. Um, as I said, I is an exclamation, so it means ah. Uh, uh, patati means um, uh, falls down, aham, I falls down. Nija vicharanam. Uh, nija means, um, nija means what is innate, natural, uh, constant, permanent, or one's own. In this context, it means oneself. So nija vicharanam means atma vicharanam. Uh, self-investigation. So what is self-investigation? Investigating from where this eye rises. That is the this eye, what he refers to as this eye is the uh, thought called eye, but he talked about in the previous verse, but he says it's the essence of the mind. This this um this eye is a thought because it appears and it disappears, it arises and subsides. So from where does it arise? Where it arises from is what he referred to in verse 16 
as uh, um, Atmanaha uh, Chitva, its own uh, nature as awareness. So what we essentially are is just pure awareness. From this pure awareness, which is which is awareness of being, so it's just the awareness I am, that is pure awareness, but from this arises this thought called I. This thought called I is not just aware of itself as I am, it's aware of itself as I am this body, I am this person, I am Michael or I am whoever. We, we, we identify ourselves with a body that has a, with the form of a body that has a particular name. So this adjunct mixed awareness, as Bhagavan will go on to clarify this in later verses, the, 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 the pure awareness I, mixed and conflated with adjuncts, is ego. So this ego, it appears and it disappears. It appears in waking and dream, it disappears in sleep. So from where does it appear and into what does it disappear? Only from our essential being, our own chitva, our essential nature as pure being and pure awareness. If we investigate this fundamental awareness I am, from which this thought called I has risen, this I will die. This is what he describes here as the I. Well, he doesn't say, he doesn't literally say uh, die, he says it will fall down. But what that implies is it will, uh, it will uh, subside in such a way that it will never rise again. That is the implication here. It's not, it's not specified, but we have to understand that by, from the context of Bhagavan's teachings as a whole. So when we investigate what this I, this rising I is, or what we, when we investigate the source from which this rising I uh, uh, arises, it falls back, it subsides back into that place from which it has risen. And this is the correct practice of self-investigation. So investigating the source from which we have risen. What is the source? As I said, it's the fundamental awareness I am, which is what he referred to in verse 16, a chimbata. And as he said in verse 16, chittam atmanaha uh, chitva darshanam tattva darshanam. So knowing the, our own chitva is knowing the reality. So the reality from which ego rises is this fundamental awareness I am. We always know this awareness I am, but now we know it mixed and conflated with adjuncts, as I am this, I am such and such a person, I am this body. So long as we're aware of it as I am this body, we're not aware of it as it actually is. So we never cease to be aware I am, but now we are mistaking ourselves to be something other than what we actually are. Um, so when we when we investigate what what we actually are, namely this fundamental awareness I am, the adjuncts drop off. That is the that is what Bhagavan describes here as I falling down. That is the the the, the thought called I, the uh, ahamriti, which is the pure I mixed and completely with adjuncts, that subsides and the pure I alone remains. That is uh, nijavicharanam. Uh, um, as I say, nija means what is innate, natural, uh, constant. In this context, it means our own real nature. So that this is investigating our own real nature. Um, does anyone have any questions on this, or shall I shall I proceed on to the next verse? Okay, I will then now continue to the next verse. In the next verse, Bhagavan says, "What happens when this eye falls down?" In the next verse, verse twenty, he says, "Ah." Ah, yes, here, here there's something. As, as I said in the previous verse, he just says, I falls down. I, as I said, that implies I will die. The fact that he's talking about the, the de death or the destruction of I is made clear from the beginning words of the next verse, verse 20. He says, Ahami uh, Nasa Baji. That means on I undergoing, it literally means on I undergoing annihilation. In other words, when I is annihilated. So that what he describes in the previous verse as I falling down 
it means the annihilation. It's not just a temporary subsidence, it's a permanent <coughs> annihilation, eradication of ego. So what he says in verse 20 is, Ahami nasa bhaji, aham aham teya, spuriti hrit swayam, parama purnasat. That means, on I undergoing annihilation, um, that is ahami uh, nasa bhaji, uh, aham aham teya, aham aham teya means as I, uh, as aham aham. Aham aham means I am I. Now we're aware of ourselves. So long as we rise as ego, we're aware of ourselves as I am this. I am this body. Ahamidam. But when we, when this ego dies, then it becomes clear to us what we actually are. I am I. That is, I am nothing other than I. <clears throat> um, uh, and, but what is it that shines as I am I? What is it that shines forth as I? I am I. Uh, spuriti. Spuriti means it, uh, it shines forth. So as I am I, it shines forth. What shines forth? Hrit. Hrit means the heart. So the heart means what we actually are, the essence of the center or essence of our of ourself. What we what we really are. Aham uh, aham aham teya spuriti hrit swayam. Swayam means of its own accord or spontaneously. So on I be undergoing annihilation, the heart shines forth spontaneously as I am I. As aham aham, uh, and then he says paramapurna sat. That implies this is paramapurna sat. Just like in the previous verse, he ended nijavicharanam. How that is connected with the rest of the verse is it implies this is nijavicharanam. Here, when he says paramapurna sat, it implies this is paramapurna sat. What is this? This refers to. Uh, the heart which shines forth spontaneously as I am I. This heart which shines forth spontaneously as I am I is Parama Purnasat. Parama means um, the supreme or ultimate. Uh, Purna means what is whole or, uh, or what is uh, full, complete. And uh, Sat means existence, being or reality. So what, but what shines, the heart that shines forth as I am I uh, um, that is the the the, the parama purna sat. The, it is the supreme. It is the purna. It's whole. It's full um, uh, sat being. So it's the fullness of being, the, the, uh, and it is what is supreme. What is the ultimate reality? Is the implication here? Um, as I said, the the verb he uses in the first sentence is spurati. This is uh, this is a form of a verb spur, which is the verb from which the word sporana is derived. Um, this uh, word sporana is a word that um, Bhagavan used this word to clarify things, but people have got very confused about sporana. They take sporana to be something, something new to be experienced. What spora, What when Bhagavan talks about sporana? As I say, spur means shining forth. So the sporana implies the fresh clarity of self-awareness. When he talks about, um, well, the basic meaning of sporana, sporana is a word that can be used in, in many different contexts. The basic meaning is what makes itself known. In the context of, uh, of self-investigation, uh, uh, in the context of the aham sporana, that means the the clear shining of I. In other words, the fresh clarity of uh, of self awareness. This sporana we begin to experience when we first begin to uh, investigate ourselves. That is, the more the more we turn our attention within the more clearly we become aware of ourselves as something other than the adjuncts that we now take ourselves to be. So I shines with a fresh clarity. Um, they, that fresh clarity of self-awareness is what is called the aham sporana. Um, but people take this, pe people want, because people don't understand the sense in which Bhagavan uses this term, 
it's been misinterpreted in so many ways. Some people take a humspurana to be some type sort of a, a vibration or a flashing or a palpitation or something. These are all possible meanings of the word sparana. But whatever uh whatever palpitates or uh flashes or that that these are all objective things. Here what Bhagavan is talking about is the pure shining of I, in other words, the pure, the, the awareness of our self as our self alone. This is what he means by, that's why he often connects uh, this uh, term, ahamaham, or in Tamil, nan nan, I am I, with the word sporana. That is, when we look within to see what we actually are, we become aware of ourself as something distinct from these adjuncts. So what am I? I am just I. When we when we begin to practice self investigation, obviously the sporana, though it's a fresh clarity, it's not a full clarity. As we go deeper and deeper in the practice, the clarity shines, the, the, the clarity of awareness shines more and more clearly. So there are different degrees of sporana, and when that when we turn our attention within sufficiently deeply. Uh, so deeply that our attention is thereby withdrawn from all other things, then we recognize ourselves as pure awareness. That is the fullness of sparana. What he's talking about here is sparana in its fullness. When there's the full, complete clarity of self-awareness, then I dies. So sparana doesn't have a it's it's a it, it's a clarity of self-awareness. Obviously, there's not one fixed degree of clarity, very different degrees of clarity. As we go deeper and deeper in the path, we experience deeper and deeper degrees of sparana, deeper and deeper degrees of clarity. In some contexts, for example, in Vichara Sangraham, Bhagavan uses an analogy uh, for sp uh, sparana. He says, just like a flame that catches a piece of camphor will continue burning until the Camper is extinguished, unless, of course, you you deprive it of oxygen. But normally, if you put a flame on a, a, a piece of camphor, the piece of camphor will continue burning. When the camphor is uh, is burnt out, the flame subsides. So Bhagavan, in some context, he talks about the, uh, the subsidence of sparana. What he means by the subsidence of sparana is not the subsidence of the clarity, but the subsidence of the newness. That is, so long as we we are um, we are not so familiar with the with that this fresh clarity with, with this clarity of self awareness, it seems to us to be something new and fresh. So during practice, as we go deeper and deeper within, we seem to be experiencing ourselves with greater and greater degree of clarity. So it seems something new and fresh. When the when the sporana finally uh, swallows ego, when ego is swallowed. The clarity loses its newness, its freshness. This is what Bhagavan means by the subsidence of sparana. Uh, so it's not that the clarity subsides, it is the newness of the clarity that subsides. When the, the newness will subside when we recognize it as sahaja. Sahaja means what is natural, what is innate, what is ever present. So we will recognize it as sahaja only when Ego dies when the the I that rose as I am I am uh, this body when that I dies, uh, the, uh, when that I is 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 consumed by the sporana by the clarity of self awareness, then the clarity of self awareness loses its its newness and it's recognized as sahaja. So what Bhagavan means by the subsidence of sporana is the subsidence of the. Uh, the, the, the newness, and it's then recognized as sahaja. So in this, in the context of this verse, when he uses the word spurati, he's talking about the full clarity, the shining forth of the full clarity of self-awareness, because he says spurati hrit. Hrit means the heart. It's the heart that eventually shines forth in all its fullness as I am I. This, this is the, 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 uh, the point at which 
uh, in other contexts, he des- he describes as the subsidence of sparana when sp- when it shines forth as something that is entirely natural. So when Bhagavan uses terms like sparana and so many other terms, we need to understand that the exact meaning of the term is dependent on the context in which he uses it. That is, the subject Bhagavan is talking about is something that is beyond the grasping power of, um, of the mind. It cannot be, cannot be grasped by thought. It cannot be adequately expressed in words because words, words are instruments of thought. What cannot be uh, grasped by uh, mind cannot be expressed in words. So whatever words Bhagavan uses, they're all pointers. They're pointing our attention back at ourselves, pointing our attention deeper and deeper within. So the, the words he uses, we shouldn't try and uh, give fixed meanings for them. We need to understand what each word means in each particular context. Uh, because what Bhagavan is talking about is that which cannot be adequately expressed in words. For example, in this verse, he talks about I being annihilated. Then when I ego is annihilated, who is to know this shining forth? Uh, what is to know the shining forth is that which is ever present. But in the view of that which is ever present, nothing shines forth because it's eternally shining. So this is a very, very subtle um, subject Bhagavan is talking about, these words are just giving us an indication. That is, from our point of view, now there seems to be an ego. So a time will come when this ego will be, uh, will be, um, will be swallowed by the clarity of awareness that we experience by turning within. When, when, when this ego is annihilated by that clarity, the clarity, uh, shines forth in the sense that it, it of course that clarity is ever shining but it seems to be obscured by ego so when ego when the, when when um it's like when 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 you if you mistake a, a rope to be a snake if you look at the snake very carefully at a certain point you recognize oh it's a rope as soon as you know it's a rope the snake disappears so the rope seems to have shone, seems to shine forth, but of course it was always shining. What we were seeing all along was only a rope. But when we recognize it as what it actually is, it seems to be a, a, a new revelation to us. Of course, the snake hasn't under sorry, the rope hasn't undergone any change. Uh, likewise with this, the, 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 it's from the perspective of, uh, of ego, this seems to be something new. But as soon as this new thing is experienced, ego is thereby swallowed by it. But So it really can't be adequately expressed in words. So what Bhagavan describes here, these all just pointers. But we, we can really understand what Bhagavan is talking about here only by following the path that he is teaching us. That is the path of that he described in the previous verse in Investigating uh, aham, aham ayam kota bhavati chimbata. That is in, uh, investigating or meditating on that, but on on the on on what from where this ego rises. From where does it rise? It rises only from the pure awareness I am. So that is what we're investigating. When we investigate this pure awareness I am, when we when we when it sh- when we investigate it so keenly, but we see nothing other than the pu- than than I am. That is the state of pure awareness. That will swallow ego, and what then shines forth is the pure awareness in all its fullness. Uh, that's what he describes as aham aham taya spuruti hritsvayam. And this this what shines forth, it is not actually something new. It's, uh, it is parama purnasat. If uh, it's supreme whole reality. Um, does anyone have any questions on either of these two verses? Uh, sir, we have a question okay. uh, coming okay. in from Mr. Sushil Motwani, and I shall okay. read it here. Okay, right. Uh, quote, when the I thought subsides and the self is revealed, yes. is that the reflected consciousness? Unquote. No, the reflected consciousness is the I thought. What is called chitabhasa is that is the 
what you refer to as the self, that means that Rupa, our own real nature, that is the pure awareness. The in the view of pure awareness, there is only pure awareness, because pure awareness means awareness that is not aware of anything other than itself. So in the view of pure awareness, there are no vishayas. Um, there's just there's just pure being, pure awareness. And that is obviously one, not two, two separate things. So what you call the self, that is Atmaswarupa, is the pure consciousness. When we rise as ego, that is pure pure awareness or pure consciousness is is the is the fundamental awareness I am, but it, in, pure awareness is not aware of anything other than itself. So being aware of ourselves as just I am and not being aware of anything else, that is the state of pure awareness. When we rise as ego, we are not aware of us. We, we are always aware of ourselves as I am, but we're not just aware of us. We're not aware of ourselves as just I am. We're aware of ourselves as I am such and such a person. Because we are aware of ourselves as this body, we're consequently aware of so many other forms. That is, this body is a form of five sheaves. Because we take this form of five sheaves to be ourself, we become aware of so many other things corresponding to each of these sheaves. That is, because we're aware of this physical body as I, we're aware of physical forms. Because we're aware of the mind as I, we're aware of mental forms, and so on. So um, all other forms appear only because we take ourselves to be this, um, this, this form of this body. What, what is... Um, uh, everything but ego is aware of, everything other than ourself that we are aware of doesn't actually exist. It's not actually real. It merely seems to exist. So e as ego, we're aware of so many things that don't actually exist, that merely seem to exist in our awareness. So being aware of what is not real is not real awareness. So ego is described as chidabasa. The basic meaning of chidabasa, abasa means a likeness or a semblance. So the basic meaning of Chidabhasa is a likeness of awareness. In other words, it's not real awareness. It's not pure awareness. It, it's something that seems to be awareness, but it's not pure awareness. So it's called Chidabhasa. Abhasa also means a reflection in the sense that if you uh, s uh, look in a mirror, you see a reflection of yourself. That You see a likeness of yourself. That is, the reflection is a likeness of whatever it's a, a reflection of. So, in that sense, it, it, it can also, Chidabas can also be uh, uh, it, uh, translated as a reflection of awareness. But uh, a deeper, more fundamental aware, uh, meaning of Abasa is uh, a semblance or a seeming. So, a sem uh, this ego is a semblance of pure of, of awareness. It's not awareness in its pure condition, because in its pure condition, there's no awareness of anything other than itself. It is, because it, there's awareness of ourself as I am this body, and consequently awareness of other things, this is a mere semblance of awareness. So, but, but when when Ego, when, when ego turns its attention within to see who am I, when it sees itself as it actually is, it's seeing itself as pure awareness. Ego is the false awareness, I am this body. So as soon as ego sees itself as pure awareness, it ceases to be ego and remains as pure awareness. So this is the, dis the dissolution of the uh, Chidabhasa, the reflected awareness, in the pure awareness that we actually are. This is like if you're if you're standing at the entrance of a cave, outside there's bright sunlight, in the cave there's darkness. If you have a mirror, you can use the mirror to shine the uh, to, to reflect the light of the sun into the cave so you can see things in the darkness of the cave. You, you can use the reflected light from the mirror to see the things in the cave. So that 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 reflected light is very useful so long as you're interested in what's in the cave. But if you want to see the source from which that light has come, you have to turn the mirror back towards the sun. If you face the, if the mirror turns towards the sun, what happens to the reflected light? 
it gets swallowed by the sunlight. That is, you don't need a mirror to see the. You you don't need to to use a mirror to reflect the light of the sun back to itself in order to see the sun. When you turn it back, the reflected light gets uh, swallowed and the pure sunlight alone remains. The mind is like that reflected light. Now we are, because we are so interested in this, within this cave of samsara or maya, we are so interested in all these objects so many interesting things are there in this world. So many things are happening. There's daily, there's news. And uh, we have so many aims and ambitions. We want to improve our, uh, our self in life. We want to learn more or we want to accumulate more money or we want to have a bigger family. Or we, 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 We're constantly, we, we're so interested in all these things that are appearing in this, in this, uh, this cave of samsara. We are not we haven't been we haven't taken interest yet in knowing the source of the light by which we are knowing all these things if we if we begin to lose interest in these things because we've been experiencing these things for countless gemmas that is in, in in the past we've experienced wealth we've experienced poverty we've experienced um uh, uh, high social status low social status we've been through it all we've we've gone through this so many times or we've been learning we've been ignorant we've been everything we, we've been through it all so we we reach a point where we begin to lose interest we, we begin to see through all these um the seeming pleasures of this world but they none of these pleasures are satisfying however much wealth we have however much learning we have however much social status we have however much political power we have however much what a loving family we have, whatever it may be, or whatever we seek to achieve, none of these things satisfy us. So at a certain point, we begin to lose interest in these things. And we want we begin to ask, what is behind all these things? That is, how do we know all these things? It's only by the light of awareness. So what is the source from which this light of awareness comes? If we turn our attention back within to see who am I, this reflected light of mind merges back into the into the source of the light, the pure awareness I am. That's like turning the mirror back to face the sun. So we don't we don't actually need the reflected light of uh, of of the mind to know ourselves. We don't need the reflected light from the mirror to know the sun. But by turning towards the sun, we lose ourselves in that. But that is the light from the mirror is lost in the sunlight. Likewise, when the mind, the reflected light called ego, turns within to see who am I, that reflected light is swallowed by the source of that light, the pure awareness I am. So it, it is not, it is the, it is the dissolution of the, the, that is when we turn within to know what we actually are and are thereby swallowed by what we actually are, that swallowing of ego, that is the dissolution of the reflected light. Because the reflected light becomes superfluous. Once you have, once you are facing the original light, you no longer need the reflected light. I hope that's an adequate answer to that question. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. We yes. have uh, we have another question this time from Nira Kashyapji. The question is, and I quote. Is I am still the ego sense or is it the pure awareness? Unquote. Okay. This is, this is something we need to understand very carefully, very clearly. Just think about it carefully. What, when you say I am, what does I am mean? It means I exist. So I am is referring to our existence, to our being. Our existence or our and or our being, I mean, they, obviously they mean the same existence and being. Our existence is real. There's no doubt about our existence. The problem is now what we are what we have to question is not our existence. We have to question our identity. Now we are not aware of ourselves as just I am. We're aware of ourselves as I am uh I am uh, Nira, I think you said your name. Uh, uh, so I am Nira, that is of an identity. You're identifying yourself as a certain person, as a certain body. 
that identity is false. What is real is your being. So I am refers to our being, our existence. That that is ever shining. The the awareness I am nearer, I am this body, that shines only in waking and dream. In sleep, what shines is only I am. So even when I am nearer is shining, within I am nearer, the heart of I am nearer, is I am. So I am is the heart. I am is the reality. I am is Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. So I am is our existence. Our existence is real. What is false is our identity. So we, we, that's why we need to investigate our fi- self to find out who am I or what am I. So we're investigating, to, we're investigating this false identity to find out what we actually are. When we find out what we actually are, We are nothing other than our own being. We're nothing other than I am. So the final clarity that shines forth, spuriti hrit swayam, how does it shine forth? It shines forth as aham aham. Uh, Aham aham means I am I. So now we're aware of ourselves as I am this, aham idam. When we when we turn our attention within to investigate what we actually are, this false awareness I am this dies. Ahami nasa baji. That's what Bhagavan means. There, that that will die, and what shines forth is the true awareness I am I. So our false identity is uh, is replaced by the real identity I I am I. So. I am I means I am nothing other than my own being, because I refers to our being. So, uh, so I am I means uh, another way of saying it: I am, I am. Uh, so I am refers to our being. So I am does not mean ego. I am me- means refers only to our own being. Um, in recent. Times in the recent decades, there has been a huge amount of confusion about this because, though Bhagavan was very clear and very explicit about this, there's a person who was living in Bombay a few years ago called Nisargadatta Maharaj, and many people took his teachings to be the same as Bhagavan. But anyone with any depth of understanding of Bhagavan's teachings will clearly see that what he was teaching was actually something quite different and he confused pe- many people about this i am because he he's what what he said about i am was he was often contradicting himself because sometimes he talked about i am as if it's the reality but sometimes he said i am is the first ignorance the reason for all this confusion is because he didn't distinguish our existence from our identity. Our existence is I am, that is real. Our identity is I am this or I am that, that is false. So because he failed to make clear that distinction, he confused so many people. Why he didn't make that distinction clear, God alone knows. Maybe he didn't clearly understand it, but Bhagavan has made it so clear. But because people don't read Bhagavan carefully enough, they don't think... Merely reading Bhagavan is not sufficient. It's important to read Bhagavan, but it's also important to... The sravana is important, but far more important than sravana, is, or far more efficacious than mere sravana, is the manana. We need to think deeply about it. We need to understand what Bhagavan is saying. If we understand what Bhagavan is saying, I am is the reality. I am is our being. I mean, it. it you, we we can't... And some people say, oh, Nisargadatta, uh, when he talks about I am, he meant the ego. But I, I am is not ego. The, the words I am, what does it mean? It means I exist. It's our existence. So you you can't misuse words. You can't um, call black is white and white is black. You're creating confusion. I am, the, the word, the the, the the uh, phrase I am is a self-explanatory phrase. It means I exist. It's referring to our existence. So that 
has to be true. Our existence can't be false. Everything else can be false, but our existence cannot be false. Because who is it who is aware of all these other things? They may all be false. Everything else may be false, but our, our existence cannot be false. Because if we didn't exist, we couldn't be aware of anything. So the very fact that we are aware is proof of our existence. The awareness is what we refer to when we say I. And uh, existence is what we refer to when we say am. So I am is our existence and our awareness, such it. So I am means only our own reality, what we actually are, our own existence. And as Bhagavan said, it's, oh, that I am in its pure condition, that is Brahman, that is what we actually are. Only when that is mixed and conflated with adjuncts, as I am this or I am that, do all, uh, do, does all confusion arise? So the, the ego, the false awareness, I am this, uh, I am this body. This is the root of all confusion. If we want to remove all confusion and experience pure awareness, as Bhagavan says in verse sixteen, drishyabaritam, we need to withdraw or, or uh, draw the mind back from all everything that is known. And focus its attention. We need to focus our attention only on our own chitva. That means our own awareness. The chitva is that fundamental awareness I am. That is such it. That is what we need to hold on to. That is what we need to attend to. When we attend to that, the adjuncts drop off and the pure awareness alone remains. So I am is the reality. Bhagavan often used to say, I or I am is the first name of God. It's the natural name of God. It's the natural name of all of us. The, the language doesn't matter whether you say it in Sanskrit or in, in Tamil or in English or in any Hindi or whatever the language is. The, the words don't matter. What does, in whatever language you say it, what does the word I am refer to? Whether you say I am or in English, or Nani Rekrain in Tamil, or Ahamasmi in Sanskrit, or Je suis in French, or whatever the language may be, um, what it refers to is our being. That is what is real. Our being is real, our existence is real, our identity is false. So we, why we are investigating us, ourselves now? Because we have this false identity. That's why we need to investigate, who am I? What am I? We're investigating our identity. Well, in order to identi investigate our identity, what we need to attend to is ourself, our own existence. When we attend to our existence, I am, then we find I am nothing other than I am. I am not this or that. I am just I. Aham, aham. So I, I hope that's a clear answer to that question. Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, so we have a follow-up question from Sushil Motwani ji, and I shall read. Yes. Quote, in some, <coughs> in some books, there is a mention of Prarab. Sorry, para, para, para Brahma and Turiya Tetra, beyond the fourth state. Kindly throw some light on these. Unquote. Again, the, the, these terms, they're really unnecessary terms because you cre create confusion. If you talk about Brahman, and then you talk about Para Brahman, are there then two things? Brahman and something beyond Brahman. Parabrahman means uh, the supreme Brahman. But are there two Brahmans? One ordinary Brahman and one Parabrahman. Uh, this again is something that Nisargadatta seems to create a lot of confusion about because he often talks about Parabrahman as if it's something other than Brahman. Parabrahman is only Brahman. It's just another way of saying it. Whether you say God or the supreme God, it's the same God. There aren't, two, there aren't more than one God. Whether we say Bhagavan or the Supreme Bhagavan, it's only one Bhagavan. So Brahman and Parabrahman are one and the same. Likewise with Churiya and Churiya Tita. The, the, the term, uh, the, the original term that was used was Churiya. Or actually, I think in, in this term originates from the... Uh, um, from, uh, um, uh, a Manduki Upanishad, but in, in the Manduki Upanishad, I think it's uh, it's not actually the term Churiya is used. I think Churiya is used by, um, it's another term in Sanskrit, I've forgotten what it is, but means the fourth. Um, 
um, Godapada in his Karaka, he used this term Churiya, but it means the same. Um, uh, it means the fourth. Why it is called the fourth? Because now we experience three states. We experience waking, dream, and sleep. These seem to us to be real. So when we are taught that there's some state beyond these, these three, it is called Churiya. It's called the fourth. Actually, as Bhagavan clarified, and it's also it's been clarified by Godapada and Shankara and so many others, that what is though it's called the fourth, it's not actually the fourth. It's the only real state because waking, dream, and sleep are all unreal. So the, the fourth, what, what is called the fourth is actually the only real state. So it's not really the fourth because it's not really the fourth. In some texts, they refer to it as Churiatita, beyond the fourth. That, that doesn't mean that there's some fifth state. That's how many people have misinterpreted it. As if, as the truth is there's only one state. The one true state is sometimes called the fourth, which for people who, who lack clear understanding, they will think, oh, there are four states. Not only these three, there's some fourth state. We shouldn't take it literally. It's not literally the fourth. It's referred to the fourth as the fourth to distinguish it from the three unreal state, but it's the only real state. That which underlies um, the, the other the three false states, that is the real state. That is the state of pure awareness. I am. That is the fourth. Um, so it's not really the fourth because it's not really the fourth. In some texts, they've referred to it as beyond the fourth, Churiatita. So people who who were already misunderstanding but before taking the fourth in a literal sense, they took Churiatita also in a literal sense. So they thought they were literally, um, they're not literally just four states, there are five states. Recently, someone sent me something asking about this, and they were saying it, it was someone who had written an article saying that the it's only the metaphysicians who the, the people who specialize in metaphysics who talk about four states, but those who have experience from actual um, from from actual spiritual practice, they have discovered a fifth state. This is all. This is not a dwaita. This is this is all. Um, Plurality. According to Advaita, ekam eva advaitiam. There is one only without a second. So, it, because it's one only without a second, it, it's not literally the fourth, though it's referred to uh, metaphorically as the fourth, it's actually the only one. And there is nothing other than that, no state beyond that. So, Churi, as Bhagavan said, Churiya Tita is just another name for Churiya. It's, it, it, we, we, we need to, when terms are used, we need to understand what the terms are referring to. If we try, if we give literal meaning, to terms that are used metaphorically, we will get into confusion. We we all come to this spiritual path in confusion. The, the root of all confusion is ego. Because we've risen as ego, we are now in confusion. So if we take all everything that is said literally, we'll, we just add to our confusion. Why, are, why is in, in spiritual texts, why is the truth often so often spoken about metaphorically? Because it is beyond the range of thoughts and words. So it, we cannot adequately express it literally. So often expressing things metaphorically is the best way of expressing things. But it requires a subtle understanding. If people... Uh, take things literally, take things which are meant metaphorically. If they take it literally, then they just add to their confusion. So, when when the term parabrahman is used, it means nothing but Brahman. When the term churiyatita is used, it means nothing but churiya. When the ch term churiya, the fourth, is used, it means nothing but the one and only state that actually exists, namely the state of pure awareness, which is what is ever shiny in our heart as I am. So sometimes the, the um, if people lack the ability to 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 think deeply and to understand subtle concepts, sometimes the the, the what is said to clarify things it it ends up uh, confusing matters. So, in order to understand 
a Dvaita correctly, in order to understand the works of Gold, the Upanishads, the works of Godapad, the works of Shankara, and Bhagavan's works correctly, what is essential? Firstly, Sravana. First, we have to read them. We have to see what's written there. But merely reading is not sufficient because if you read it, you're liable to take the wrong meaning. You need to think deeply about it in order to understand it correctly. And merely, so the reading of, uh, or hearing it is called sravana. Thinking deeply about it in order to understand it is called manana. But we shouldn't even stop there. What is most important of all is the nidityasana. Nidityasana means deep contemplation. In the context of Advaita, it means atmavichara. That is, what are all these, what are all the uh, Advaitic texts pointing at? They talk about one only without a second. And they say, what is that? Tatvamasi, you are that. So all of the Advaitic texts ultimately are pointing back at one thing and one thing alone, ourself. Tatvamasi, you are that. So before we come to the path of Advaita, we are looking for things outside. We're looking for a God or we're looking for Brahman, or we're looking for jnana, or we're looking for happiness. We, whatever, we, whatever we seem to be lacking, we look for it outside. So the, the, the Upanishads tell us, you are that, Tattvamasi. The aim of their saying you are that is, stop looking outside, look within. What you are seeking is within you. So whether you're seeking God or Brahman or, or, or happiness or whatever you say you're seeking, it is there within you. Turn within. See, know yourself. That is the implication. But if people don't, if people fail to understand that practical implication, they go on and on reading the books without understanding correctly. So, the nidhiti asana is to know who am I. When you are told you are that, what should our response be? As Bhagavan says in verse thirty-two of uh, Uludunaptu, when the Vedas say you are that. Instead of investigating what am I, and thereby knowing and being what one actually is, thinking I am not this body, I am that, is just due to weakness of mind. So the aim of the Upanishads, the aim of, of Godapada's Karika, the aim of, uh, of Shankara's Bhashyas, the aim of all of Bhagavan's teachings is simply to turn our attention back to ourselves. So to, we need to see who am I. We need to turn our attention back within. The real clarity comes from the practice. That is, we get a certain amount of clarity from reading. We get more clarity from thinking carefully about it. But the real clarity comes only from the practice. When we go deep in the practice, in the Nidityasana, that gives us a greater degree of clarity. So when we go back and read the same text, we understand more, we we. We recognize the meaning, the implication of those texts more clearly and more deeply than we were able to before. So because we are able to recognize it more, the sravana becomes deeper, then the manana becomes deeper, and then the deeper mana, that also contributes to a deeper nidityasana. So this sravana, manana, nidityasana, these are to go on hand in hand. They're an iterative process. We read we think about it, we put it into practice. When we read again, we think about it, we put it into practice. That is this sravana and manana is a great... Uh, what is most important is the niti kyasana, turning within to see who am I. That's what's most important. But a great support to us in this path is, is Bhagavan's teachings. So by reading his teachings, thinking about them and putting them into practice and coming back to them, reading them, thinking about them, putting them into practice, this iterative process, this in, is what enables us to go deeper and deeper within. So we, the, the text will inevitably be uh, misunderstood by people who haven't actually turned within to see who am I. This practice is essential because without this, where, what is the source of all clarity? But well, what is, the, the, the mind, as we were saying earlier, the mind is a chitabhasa, it's a, it's a reflection of awareness. The source from which that, that light comes, that reflected light comes, is the heart, is, is, is the pure awareness I am. So the more we turn within to attend to the pure awareness I am, the more, so to speak, we are bathing our mind in clarity. 
the clarity of pure awareness. The more we bathe ourselves in that inner clarity, the more clearly we will be able to understand the true import of what is said in all in Bhagavan's teachings and in the Upanishad, the Bhagavad, Brahma Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, Shankara, Gaudapada, everything will become clearer to us the deeper we go within. What is most important is going within, looking within more and more. Then we won't get confused when we come across terms like Brahman and Parabrahman. It'll be obvious to us. How can they be referring to two different things? How can there be more than one Brahman? There can only be one Brahman. How can there be more than one? Uh, how can there be Churya and something beyond Churya? Churya means the only real state. Anything that is beyond the real state is an unreal state. So it doesn't actually mean it's beyond. It means <clears throat> why it's called Churyatita is just to indicate that though it is called the fourth, it's not really the fourth. It is beyond all this, beyond first, second, third, fourth, because it is one only without a second. So that is the aim of it. But people miss the intention and they take the words literally and they get themselves into a confusion. Does that adequately answer that question? Uh, Michael, we have another question from Sushil Motwani Ji. Should yes. we take it up next oh, time or do you think you might um, need to give a quick if, response? If, if you can spare the time, I think it'd be good to try and finish it now. Let's, yeah, let's try and to respond to him in, in five minutes, please. Okay. So I shall read the question. Quote. Mm. Our self-investigation and contemplating on the experience of the deep sleep state while awake, the same practices, unquote. Um, yes, if we understand correctly what we are doing. That is, what is the experience of deep sleep? What is it that shines in deep sleep? Only one thing shines in sleep, deep sleep, our own being. I am. In sleep, we are not aware of anything other than our own existence, our own being. I am. So if we understand that, that is the difference between waking, dream, and sleep is in waking and dream, sorry, in sleep, we are aware just I am. In waking and dream, we're aware I am. Plus, we're aware of so many other things, because in, in waking and dream, we're not aware of ourself as just I am. We're aware of ourself as I am this or that. I, I, am, uh, I am this person. I am uh, Sushil. Uh, so because of, that, because of that identification of ourself with a name and form, we are aware of so many other names and forms. In sleep, we're aware just I am. So the one thing that is real in all three states is that, that fundamental awareness I am. In sleep, that alone shines. In waking and dream, other things seem to shine. So the experience of deep sleep is the experience I am. The pure awareness I am, that is the, what we experienced in sleep. That is what we are to meditate on now. That, that is self-investigation. That is... In, uh, attending to our fundamental awareness, I am, is what is meant by self-investigation. So if we understand this correctly, yes, they are the same practice. But if we're, if we're trying to imagine what, what was there in sleep, and they, then we, we, <clears throat> we need to recognize that what shone in sleep is what is shining even now. That is our fun that fundamental awareness of our own existence. So all these sort of questions will become, the answers to all such questions will become clear to us to the extent to which we understand Bhagavan's teachings correctly. And we will understand his teachings correctly to the extent to which we put it into practice. There are so many ways in which we can, that is, the practice of self-investigation cannot adequately be expressed in words. But the words can... But whatever Bhagavan has used many different words to point us at this practice. So all Bhagavan's words are all pointers. If we recognize them, what they are pointing at 
ultimately, they're all pointing at the same thing. They're pointing at ourself alone. In fact, all of Vedanta is pointing at ourself alone. If we understand correctly, all the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra, the Bhagavad Gita, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Godapad's Karika, Mand uh, Shankara's Bhashyas, and all the countless other texts, if we understand them correctly, they're pointing only at ourselves. If they're not pointing at ourselves, they are, they're not true Vedanta. So Vedanta is all about knowing who am I. So if we understand that, everything will become clear, everything will fall into place. But we need to understand the basic principles. Nobody has expressed the basic principles of Advaita in such a clear, simple and practical manner as Bhagavan has. So we are very, very fortunate to have texts like the Supadesha Sara and Dula Dunapadu and Nana and Dharanacha Stuti Panchakam, because in all these, Bhagavan is, has distilled the very essence of all of Vedanta and is expressing it in a very simple and clear manner. And most importantly, what, what is most unique about Bhagavan's teachings, he is constantly stressing the practice. What is what is to be done? Why, why did it say you are that? Because we need to, what we need to investigate is not that, we need to investigate ourselves. If we investigate what is referred to as, tw as twum, you, that is ourself, if we investigate ourselves, since that is ourself, we, uh, by knowing ourselves, we know that. So how to know Brahman? Know yourself. How to know God? Know yourself. How to experience happiness? Know yourself. How to know myself? Come within and see who am I. That is what it is. So Bhagavan has made things so simple, so clear, and so practical. And if we follow his path, all these things become clear. So then when the questions arise, the answer will also arise with it. It will be clear to us. How am I able to answer all these questions? Just because I'm just so familiar with Bhagavan's teachings, and I've tried a little bit to put them into practice to the best of my ability. So it's very obvious. It, it's When people ask me these questions, I see the answers there. Bhagavan has already given us the answers. We just need to apply his teachings correctly, and we can find the answers to all questions. I hope that's a useful answer. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arana Chalaramanaya. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, both Niraji and Sushil Motwaniji are uh, offering their thanks and gratitude for your responses on the well, on All the thanks YouTube to Bhagavan, channel. because I am just relaying what Bhagavan has, uh, has, um, has taught us. So it's, uh, the thanks are due only to Bhagavan. Thank you, sir. Uh, very, very insightful and very practical guidance uh, we received from you this evening. Uh, Bhagavan's teachings are very practical and very insightful.